Well, let's go ahead and get started with who we have. So um, again, I am recording this, so you are free to leave your cameras on or not. Um, I have everyone muted, um, but if you have a question, then feel free to type it into the chat and we will be sure to address that at the end. Um, so why don't we start with you, Richard, if you don't mind, um, and then you can just kind of start by telling everybody your story and um, your transition to living on your own and kind of what's, because that's a fairly new-ish thing for you, so kind of how, how that's been going for you. Sure, thanks, Melanie. And thank you for having me, for sure. Um, a little bit about my story is um, in 2008, I dove into a swimming pool and broke my neck at the C6 level. Um, which left me with quadriplegia. So I had limited use of my arms and fingers. Um, but I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to meet Melanie as she was my therapist at uh, VCU. Um, so I've been living with quadriplegia for the past 12 years. Um, I kind of jumped through over quite a bit. Um, I was going to set out on the um, independent living path um, probably about seven years ago um, and started looking for a place and evaluating my needs and, and um, what resources I may need to look for in order to do that. Um, unfortunately, as life happens, um, uh, my family situation changed as my father passed away and uh, I kind of reevaluated that uh, decision to pursue living independently um, based on feeling the need to uh, be around for my mother uh, should she need anything. Um, but fast forward quite a few years and <clears throat> another life transition occurred where um, she wanted to um, transition herself to a more uh, retirement-like community, which being 36 didn't accept me, which um, has its pros and cons as many things do. Um, so I had been evaluating where I was and developing a, a plan to move forward in <clears throat> start living on my own. Um, so last, uh, last spring, um, I began building a, an accessible home uh, for myself uh, to live independently and then um, have caregivers come in as I need them. Um, which kind of takes us into one of the main challenges is if you require caregiving, how do you find it? And for me, it's been a, a quite a bit of a challenge given the state of uh, the pandemic that's going through our um, society and across the world at this point. Um, so at this point, my mother is helping me out in the mornings, which has given me an opportunity um, to line up um, or be prepared and positioned to have an aide come in once all of this pandemic kind of clears up, uh, which is involved um, using an EDCD waiver, if y'all are familiar with that, which is a consumer directed waiver, which technically is through Medicaid. Um, I do mine through a, a Medicaid buy-in, <coughs> excuse me, if you work, are employed above the threshold for regular Medicaid, uh, you can um, do what's called the Medicaid buy-in program, um, which allows you all the, the benefits of Medicaid uh, while also allowing you to earn above the minimum threshold or the maximum threshold, I'm sorry. Um, so that's, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna, we got dry all of a sudden. Um, so in doing so, um, I've been working with the Department of Social Services 
um, to not only get onto the Medicaid buy-in program, um, but I'm now uh, in the middle of locating a facilitator who will then administer um, the EDCD waiver, which will allow me to hire whomever I want to, to help with some of the care that I need. <clears throat> um, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's been one of the main things I've been working through since I've been living independently beginning in July, um, as well as take to work um, resources as well that kind of help you transition from social security disability into a, uh, a uh, gainfully employed job, um, which uh, that I'm sure will be the biggest challenge <clears throat> for most folks who go that path. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, considering that a lot of it is not contingent on what you do and whomever's helping you through that process knows. If a lot of it is contingent on the Social Security Administration, which can be rather inefficient. So <clears throat> if you do look to um, become gainfully employed, or if you are, uh, I would highly suggest uh, using a ticket to work facilitator. Um, they are uh, paid through a federal grant. So it, um, the no cost is absorbed by us as um, recipients. And they know all of the ins and outs of Social Security and kind of navigating all of the, the benefits and, and how to get the most out of your benefits uh, as possible. Because quite frankly, I'm not sure anybody knows exactly how they work and how they work most efficiently and the processes and, and timing of everything. Um, but the facilitators are as knowledgeable, probably more knowledgeable than anyone. Um, beyond that, just day-to-day -day living, I was lucky enough to be the recipient of a service dog through Canine Companions for Independence. Um, she's been a great help. I didn't know, I didn't realize how much I needed a service dog as opposed to just wanting one. But um, it's little moments of convenience, whether it's closing a door behind you and kind of saving some energy to do some more transfers in and out of bed or whatnot. Um, she's been a, a great help to me. Um, another big thing in living independently is having a plan and um, then having a backup plan and then a contingency plan to your backup plan. Um, should a caregiver not show up, you certainly need to have someone come in if you're unable to perform the necessary tasks. So planning, what is it? What is the saying? An ounce of planning is worth a pound of cure, something like that. I don't know. I just made that up. Something like that. Um, That's great. We'll go with that. Sure. I'll take it. Um, but if you can anticipate where you may have uh, problematic situations in your home, um, for me, that's flipping my chair over. Um, kind of have a plan in place that you can go to should an unfortunate event happen where uh, you need some extra help or um, something arises where <clears throat> it's out of the norm. Um, it's kind of easy to plan for the normal day-to-day -day, uh, things. It may be challenging to accomplish them, but um, it's really good to have contingency plans in place. So for me, when I do flip my chair, which Melanie knows I do quite often, uh, the first time I didn't, I didn't have a very good plan uh, because my phone was in the garage playing on the Bluetooth speaker. My cell phone had fallen, was in there. And my house phone was up on a countertop at the back of it. Um, so luckily I was able to mitigate my lack of planning by uh, using what was around me, including a yardstick and 
things to throw. And I eventually knocked the phone down to myself to be able to call the non-emergency fire department uh, phone number. And they popped over and righted me and uh, everything was good to go. But uh, I learned a very valuable lesson on that unfortunate incident. And um, now I make sure that a phone is where I can easily reach it um, should I be reaching for it from the floor. Um, other than that, I'm open to any questions anybody has. Uh, I know that was kind of jumping all around, but I don't want to take up the whole evening. So I will pass it back unless there are any questions now or if you want to save them for the end. We'll save them for the end, but thank you. That was awesome. Thank you, Richard. I really appreciate your story and I'm honored to be a part of it. So, um, and then Richard also um, is a great advocate for people with spinal injuries. He works for the United Spinal Association, if I'm saying that right. Um, so um, he's a great resource uh, for folks in that situation. Um, do you want to go ahead and uh, give away for people to contact you if they need to for that resource? Uh, sure, yeah. If um, you want to become involved with the United Spinal Association of Virginia, um, where is this being shared? On our social media platform. Okay. Um, then the, probably best to go to our website, United Spinal, United Spinal Associate, what is it? United Spinal VA.org. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and there's a contact. Uh, link on there, um, or if um, you run into Melanie, she can certainly give you my my personal contact information. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to Rob. Um, so Rob is a friend of uh, Erica, who is on our board, and so Rob, we're going to um, switch to you um, and would love for you to share your story with us um, and the same um, successes and challenges that you've had. Okay. My name is Rob Targos and I, I was born in the 1970s. I was a March of Dimes kid. I have cerebral palsy and uh, I came in like a Miley Cyrus wrecking ball. <laughs> But I was born this way, like Lady Gaga says. And that has pretty much defined a lot of my life and also some of my relationship with my parents. And because they took more of a medical model approach and I had more of a social model approach and the uh, probably the uh, some of the strategies that I use is I use my crutches as extensions and um, tools to navigate the world, and my crutches empower me, and they uh, and they always have because other people see my crutches as medical devices where I see them as the way that I go about the world. And my independent living story is um, I moved out of my parents' house a month before September 11th in New York. And uh, I was in job transition at the time and thought it was the perfect time to move out. And uh, I took about six months to move. And then um, one day on September 11th, the whole world changed, similar to COVID, uh, that now just in a different way. And th But the way that I was able to become independent was I had family who was around me, my co my cousins, my aunt and uncle, and um, and some other friends from the neighborhood where I was born, and they became my zone of proximal development or my 
scaffolding and they helped me to transition to independence. And within three days after September 11th, my um, parents said, do you want to move home? I said, I spent the last six months uh, moving out. I'm not going to move home. I said, you can either support support and help me. And um, as I continue to transition out or, um, and the other issue with me moving out was my parents were in a tr transition and tra trajectory of having to retire. And I was trying to establish myself. So we were also at different points of life. And that was another way and reason why I moved out. Um, but it became, I, t it took me about two years after that to uh, get so social security because they were so overwhelmed with everything that was going on with uh, September 11th that they thought that I was gaming the system uh, because they didn't believe the all the paperwork that I had. And with all the confusion, that's why it took me over two years to, similar to Richard's story about the problems with the system. It, um, it taught me a lot about relying on myself and I grew up um, going to a local UCP um, organization where I did therapy and developed uh, um, dignity and respect for myself through my physical therapist. And, but another issue that I had was my parents, again, had the, me had the medical model in mind. So they listened more to the doctor and I had a closer relationship with the, with the therapist. And my attitude was, I see the therapist every week where I saw the doctor every year. And that, so it's been an ongoing issue of, of contention, as I said before, with independent living and my parents are understanding that. Uh, but my uh, aunt, uncle and relatives have been very supportive as I transitioned out in New York. And then Hurricane Sandy happened in 2013. And I lost power for nine weeks. Uh, I was homeless for a day. And that was uh, half, six hours too long. Um, but that also taught me that I had to rely more and more on myself. So what I did is I developed systems and processes so that it would never, it would never happen again. Fast forward a couple of years after that, I um, made the, the work transition from New Jersey down to Virginia because my sister lives down here. And then I um, moved into an apartment and stayed in an apartment for five years. And during that time, I went through the Down Syndrome Association to the Weinstein JCC to VCU and wound my way around to different organizations and different friendships. And that has been tremendously helpful for my independent living and building my own support system here. Practically, it, the Able Now account has really been helpful because it's allowed me to, to build up a little bit of cushion for myself. And two and a half years ago, I moved into my own condo. And when uh, even then I had an issue with my parents and they said, we're not gonna give you the money uh, to, for the down payment. Even though the money was set aside for me, and something that I had saved up from previous jobs, they didn't agree. So they tried to hold it, 
hold it uh, against me. And uh, then my sister had to get involved and my brother-in-law and eventually my parents relented and realized that I was making my, my own decisions. And, but the, uh, the issue there really was I grew up believing that I had to adapt to everything, everyone else and not really articulate for my own needs and wants because I was given the privilege of going to private school and, and doing other things where if I complained, people either got angry or upset or I got uh, outcasted. So I learned very quickly that I needed to adapt or uh, I wouldn't succeed. So, but I, I've realized through the LEND program and through the Virginia Board for People with Disabilities that articulation is more important and disability engagement is also um, important. And I got involved with the Statewide Independent Living Council, these. VCU and JCC, and I use a lot of creative arts. I do my own podcast, and I do community theater and other creative projects. And that has really been the hallmark of my success is my ability to redefine and reframe what my situation is to change the rules of the situation. So, and that's my story. Thank you so much for that. That is a fantastic story and I'm really excited for you and very proud of how you advocated for yourself and I'm proud that there was a physical therapist in your corner um, like myself um, to help you to learn to advocate for yourself um, and it sounds like you um, have certainly overcome quite a bit of personal challenge in addition to the physical challenge of things. Um, I was going to ask you real quick before I forget, could you tell sure. me or explain what the Able Now account is? That's not something that I'm familiar with. So the Able Now account is a um, savings account for anyone with a disability that got their disability before the age 21 and it was passed in, 2000, in 2013. Um, a better life experience um, is what it's a federal law and it's based in Virginia off of, in North Chesterfield and it's a savings account. So it allows you to, collect, to um, accumulate money up to $100,000 without losing benefits. Awesome. And how would somebody go about starting such an account? Um, they would just apply through ablenow.com uh, and certify that they have, they have a disability um, before the age 21 uh, and provide all the information to the company. Awesome, thank you for that, for sure. And I, I really liked your phrase, um, zone of proximal development. That was also a new phrase for me, but I think that speaks well to people who are close to you and help create structure. Um, one thing that you did say I wanted to ask about before we move on to Meredith, um, who has joined us, um, is you said that you put systems and processes in place um, so that all the things that had happened wouldn't happen again. What were some of those important systems and processes for you? So a lot of the, um, the systems had, had to do with um, like food food and clothes and other things. I, I didn't, I was very cost efficient when it came to, um, when I was living in Brooklyn, um, when I first, I was making, I was making just over a thousand dollars through social security. And so I learned to live on a shoestring budget. Uh, and even though I've been successful now in Virginia and, and um, doing other things, 
I still live on a shoestring budget in a lot of ways. So it's it's looking at things and saving and really deciding what the what the value is to life and not trying to not trying to compete with other people because I realized a long time ago that I really can't compete physically and even financially with with people and um, so once I realized that I was able to figure out ways to save money and effort and time for myself um, and I'm I live very modestly. Um, I'm very happy where I am, and that's all that matters to me. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you sharing your story. And um, just a reminder to everybody who's watching and listening, if you have any questions for Rob or for um, Richard, you know, feel free to put them in the chat or just make a mental or written note, and we'll get to them in just a moment. Um, we're going to move on to Meredith. Um, I'm going to bring you to the forefront here, Meredith. Um, and so Meredith is going to share her story. Um, so what we're doing is just talking about, hi, <laughs> um, about what the nature of your um, physical challenges are and kind of how you've overcome that to transition to living independently. So take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So hi, I'm Meredith Tolson. Sorry, I was late. I had just gotten off of work and then arrived home to a bit of a puppy crisis. Um, so it's always fun. Um, so my name is Meredith. I live with um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, which are two conditions that are linked, speaking of pyramal puppies, sorry if you can hear their uh, nails clacking on the floors, um, but I live um, with those two conditions. They're genetic conditions that um, impact my mobility, my ability to hold myself upright and be stable and um, a lot of my joints basically. So I, I do struggle a lot with like certain things like opening different cans. Uh, my fingers like to dislocate nicely. My hips pop out of place. Um, it's kind of fun. You know, you never know what you're gonna get. You're like a rubber band that just constantly being stretched every which way. Um, and I cope with it by being humorous and making fun of it and enjoying to laugh at it. Um, every time um, one, fun thing about POTS is that you faint a lot. Um, and every time I'm about to faint, my partner will like sing like the, the song by Kesha, like it's going down, she's yelling timber. And that just helps, you know, kind of diffuse the situation. But I think a lot of the ways that I've learned to cope um, and a lot of the ways that I've learned to just, you know, become independent on my own um, has really just been um, one, using mobility aids and like learning to actually accept mobility aids into my life um that was a big thing um and then second um is i have a service dog who's been just ungodly helpful i'm training his successor right now so it's not going too smooth um puppies are a lot of work especially if you struggle with chronic health conditions and almost pass out when you bend over um that makes it kind of difficult but um, they're wonderful in the sense that, you know, they're trained to assist me in lots of different ways. Um, my current service dog, who's fully trained, helps me by picking things up off the ground, helps pull me forward when I don't have the stamina to keep going. Um, today was, is what I would call a low spoon day, um, meaning I've got low amounts of energy, I'm exhausted. But, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know it because I have a dog that's dragging me physically through places um, to make sure that I actually can get to work even on days that I don't have the energy to. Um, and then my current dog is also being trained to do the exact same things and also tell me if um, I'm about to pass out, which will be incredibly beneficial for me. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the gist. And so you recently transitioned to living on your own, if I'm, if I'm correct. You were in school and then staying with family and now you're on your own. So what has that transition been like for you? What would you say have been some of your, other than the puppy challenge, which I think we can, we can relate to, yeah. um, what have been some of the challenges or things that you've been like, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that as far as living on my own and how did you overcome them? So a lot of them initially came when I was at school um, for the first time. Um, I realized that like going to the grocery store for me was just very difficult. Um, 
it's a lot of standing, a lot of, you know, going, it, it, a, a grocery store ship trip for me can take like five hours, not because I want it to, but because I like, I can't navigate the store as easily. And I definitely like struggle to get things um, and like load up my cart and I have to take a lot of breaks because I get so fatigued so easily. Um, and so in terms of um, just like kind of adjustments, I've learned that like, I've made corner stores my best friends. There's a CVS right downstairs and that is like a godsend for me because even though it's not like, you know, the healthiest groceries, it's something that I've found to be incredibly beneficial for like, just you know, sometimes you just need a quick meal and they do have frozen pizza. Um, so I can make do with that. Um, definitely make, um, I, I'm lucky enough to have a really supportive partner. Um, I was driving myself to my job, um, which was great most days, but then on days, like if I have a migraine or another like side effect of um, the POTS, the, the postural or static tachycardia syndrome is you either lose your vision quite easily or you get migraines, I get seizures, um, which sucks, but there are some days that I just can't drive. And so um, it definitely was a struggle for me um, for a while before he started helping out and driving me on those days um, for me to just get to work. And so I had to call out a lot over my first few weeks of like my big adult job. Um, I just graduated law school and I felt very guilty of calling out um, for a couple of those days. Um, and I, I was lucky enough um, to find a firm with, I think three or four of the employees are also disabled. So we all have like this little like, yes, we got this kind of club. So we, we do support each other quite nicely um, when one of us is down um, in a way that I, honestly, I don't think I would have found anywhere else if I were looking at other firms. This firm is very disability friendly, which is really great for me. Um, so yeah, definitely those two, um, having people help out, which is hard for me because I don't like asking for help. Um, but that's like a personal struggle um, just because like I'm, you know, I like to think I'm a strong independent woman. Um, but apparently sometimes I'm not and that's fine um, for me at least. Choose, but it's your, still your choice to ask for help or not. So exactly. <laughs> and that corner store um, game. Oh, and a kitchen stool. Um, I, because I don't like, I can't stand for so long in the kitchen. I have a chair that lives in the kitchen with me and I sit on it when I'm tired. <laughs> um, and it's like right at stove height so I can be up and like cooking. Um, it's inconvenient if I have to go get more ingredients, but I just bring everything over to the stove with me and just sit and cook. Perfect. I think there's those little things that totally make the difference in your day yeah. and what you can do. And I think... Um, what's the saying, Richard and I were going back and forth on sayings a little while ago, um, that necessity is the mother of invention. And, um, you know, whether you use a crutch or a yardstick or whatever it is that you find um, in that moment of need, you should be proud of yourself for your creativity and ingenuity in those moments um, to retain your independence. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, so I will, I did not see any specific questions in the chat, um, but I, let's see, um, I am granting the permission for anyone to unmute themselves and ask a question. Um, so, but I will ask a question in the meantime, while everyone's thinking of their brilliant question. Um, and that is what technology have you guys found? Has there been any technology that's been helpful for you and in your independence, whether it's Alexa or, I'm sorry if I just set off somebody's, but um, you know, what technology has been really important to you in your independent living? I, I've worked remotely for the, la for the last seven years. So the, and I'm usually on the inter internet. Um, so I was an early adopter before COVID and, um, and have just done a lot, already been uh, in um, doing a lot of online with spreadsheets. Uh, so that's one of the ways that I uh, find helpful with, with spreadsheets. In fact, today, 
today there was a issue with Medicare uh, and where Social Security said that I uh, owed them money and Medicare actually zeroed it out two two months ago because of, of the mistake and I went ahead and kept that record online uh, in a sheet then it, I would have gotten in, into even more trouble. So, yeah. Meredith or um, Richard. All right. Oh, sorry. That's right. Meredith or Richard, any technology that you found helpful? I'm a bit of a dinosaur, um, older beyond my years, I think, and I've kind of resisted technology as much as possible. <laughs> Um, kind of like Meredith's independent woman uh, mentality or kind of get, uh, get a little bit headstrong and, and don't acquiesce to some things that may help me as much. So I, since I've begun living on my own, I've um, kind of been more open to that and um, been very thankful for it. Not necessarily for things that I need or would not be able to do, but the minor conveniences of uh, things like an Alexa or a um, smart socket where I can turn the TV or the light on in my bedroom with my phone before I get up. Um, like I said, aren't necessities, but they make life a little bit easier and, and it makes it a little bit easier in, in some aspects uh, It kind of, um, multiples for other tasks down the road to give a little bit more energy or time. Um, it, uh, it's quite the resource that is very limited. Um, so my technological uh, journey is, is just beginning, but um, there are certainly different things out there um, that can help you. Beyond the, the everyday things that I, I use um, and have been using since uh, I became disabled, uh, such as uh, various tools to shave. Uh, since I have a lot to shave, you know, um, and things like that, and using a, an electric toothbrush where I resisted and wanted to use a regular toothbrush for so long just because that was my normal, and uh, I kind of resisted change a little bit, but. Um, you know, lots of lots of little things can go a long ways. Awesome. And uh, there's been some comments in the chat about um, using like Apple Watch and the other things. And I think that's really fantastic to use those resources. Um, Erica, I think you had some questions. Yeah, I have I had two questions, but I'll just piggyback in on what we're talking about right now. Um, and let me step away because my son's watching Will of Fortune and y'all will hear all that in the background if I don't get to a quiet place. Um, but to piggyback on that, I was just going to say, um, given COVID um, right now, I'm sure there have been things that have, that have uh, made it more difficult to live independently, um, like you, um, Richard was saying earlier, like caregivers and things of that nature. Um, but as a parent of a child with a disability, some of the things that um, I've thought of is on the positive and the negatives, but um, Aerith was saying she loves that corner store, you know, cause it's so accessible, but have y'all started to like um, utilize these, you know, I feel like there's so many like curbside pickups now and like delivery options and the visits and all these things that this virtual world has opened up for disabled, but in a way, it's like making things more accessible for people with disabilities. And I didn't know if that was something that maybe y'all were, or you didn't have access to, and now you do. What your experience, I guess, has kind of been with having those options um, more readily available. I mean, I use the grocery delivery services quite a lot. Um, they're a godsend for me um they're just so helpful and so like I mean just I, I, like I was saying the sheer amount of time and energy that it takes for me to do a proper grocery store run is 
a lot. And so um, between grocery delivery services and Amazon, um, life is a lot easier. I still like to go to the grocery store because like I don't like people picking out my avocados for me because I guarantee they're going to pick out like the most rotten avocado possible. Um, and I think I deserve better than a rotten avocado. But, um, you know, simultaneously, I'll, I, I, I will sacrifice um, avocados every once in a while. Um, if it's just like one of those weeks where I'm just like getting, you know, my butt handed to me by my chronic illnesses, um, that's a week that groceries are getting delivered. For me, it's, it's been access to telehealth. And uh, just that's been a lot easier. I've, I've been using a lot of Amazon, um, but the curbside has been really helpful. Um, and I also found out how, how many regulations were in, were in place, but especially with telehealth and other things that if it didn't affect everybody, they probably wouldn't have removed a lot of a lot of the restrictions, and that's actually something that I'm uh, petitioning Abigail Spanberger about. Is once we're done with COVID, leave things the way they are because they're it's it's easier uh, for me. Try for me. I don't drive. I use Lyft, or I did before, and. So Zoom calls were uh, have been really easy for me, especially since I'm technology driven. Um, so that's just a few of the ways that it's it's been more helpful. And I've talked to a number of friends at VC or other places that say that they're finally living in independently, um, and their friends of theirs finally understand some of the participation issues that they've been experiencing for a long time because everybody's locked down a, a lot of the time now. So it builds a lot of empathy with COVID. Absolutely, and I am with you um, on the professional side, hoping that the telehealth and other things that have happened, um, the curbside deliveries and the um, all of that will continue uh, as a service to all people, um, whether it is lazy, able-bodied people, or if it is, you know, the mom with little kids that doesn't want to drag them in the store, or somebody with a disability, that it would be a pretty extensive effort to go in the store um, when someone's getting paid to bring it to your car is a fantastic thing for sure. Um, any other questions? Anyone had any other thoughts? I had one more. This is specifically for Richard, and it was only because um, when you were discussing the EDCD waiver, um, I think it's now, well, I know for pediatrics, they call it the CCC plus now or whatever. Um, in regards to that, I just from my understanding, and I was interested because you were saying that you work and, you know, you have your own, you know, financial um, setup and things like that. I was just curious because different for pediatrics and um, for adults, but I know that they were like, they kind of gave us a baseline of like, oh, well, he qualifies for Medicaid through this waiver because he doesn't have and he doesn't money. Um, so I didn't know if it was the same for adults as it was pediatrics and if it, if there is a cap on like, um, I know with SSI, there's a cap on how much y'all can, you know, people with disabilities can make and still collect SSI. I just didn't know if that was kind of like a one in the same kind of thing. And if it is, if you could explain it um, so people know more about it. I think I, you broke up a little bit. Um, I think the question was... I'm sorry. Could you understand what I was asking in regards to that? I was just saying because I know, for example, for pediatrics, when we got the CCC plus mm -hmm. waiver, they told us that because my son doesn't work, he doesn't make money, he doesn't have any assets, he qualifies to receive Medicaid through the waiver. I just didn't know if it was the same for adults 
And if so, if you had a cap, because I know like SSI, you can only make so much money to collect that. Um, so I didn't know if it was the same um, with the EDCD waiver for children and adults. So the EDCD waiver relates specifically to caregiving. Um, you may be thinking of the waiver, um, like you said, that allows uh, pediatrics to obtain Medicaid. Um, for adults, you have to have a form of Medicaid before you are eligible for the EDCD waiver. Um, and now I should have prefaced this that um, I'm certainly not an expert on this and uh, you should certainly discuss with your caseworker. Uh, but the EDCD waiver is specifically for uh, caregivers. Now, the Medicaid buy-in, which I think is relating a little bit more to your question, um, from what I understand, and, and like I said, I've been working with a facilitator through Ticket to Work, um, timing is very important based on when you are become gainfully employed and when you apply for the Medicaid buy-in based on your assets. Um, I'll kind of leave it there because it is so murky and I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of seeking out uh, a facilitator um, who knows the ins and outs of it and, and can give um, thorough, correct information. Um, Richard, can I, I'm going to interrupt you for a second because that was actually a question I had for you is how do you, how would someone go about finding a facilitator? Because you were saying you needed to find a facilitator. How do you do that? Are there private organizations? How do you, how do you find somebody? Sure. So um, you can reach out to me for sure uh, through the United Spinal Association of, of Virginia. Um, otherwise, um, you can go on the Ticket to Work website, which is a federal website, um, and that will kind of explain the process of um, facilitators and, and what they do and, and how to find them. And I'm not to interject, but like I know from, like, that's what I was kind of wondering, because I have a child, so I'm doing it from a pediatric standpoint, but I know that with my son, um, when we got the EDCD waiver, for him, for his caregiving and everything, um, they actually provided us um, a list with local facilitators. Um, there may not be the same for adults and children, but there is a list out there um, for the area itself. That way, um, you can find the right group, you know, for who you are and what you need. Um, and that was very helpful for me. So I'm assuming that they provide the same kind of thing on their website for y'all as well. For, for the EDCD waiver, correct, caregiving. Um, yeah. DSS will provide you with a list of facilitators in your area. And this is kind of uh, one of the problems with the systems that we have to navigate is so much gets confused because a lot of the terminology is the same. Um, what I was speaking to earlier about the facilitator was through Ticket to Work, which was spe is specifically um, related to uh, returning to work and employment, becoming gainfully employed, and navigating your benefits uh, with that. So facilitator all the same, but in a different capacity. Um, and just as a reference, I did look up the website, and it is www.ssa dot gov backslash work if anyone is so inclined uh any other questions anyone have any questions you should be able to unmute yourself and ask a question or if anyone participating has a resource that's been helpful to them feel free to share that as well um but thank you all for joining us thank you um, to Richard and to Rob and to Meredith for your stories and for sharing everything um, that you shared. Um, so the whole Family Foundation is 
who is putting this on and our goal um, as people who have children with disabilities or someone in our family with a disability um, or are just advocates for people with disabilities, we are excited to do some more programs like this. And it sounds like potentially a program on what all the waiver options are would be a good place to, to start looking for the, um, for the new year, just to clarify, because it sounds like the waters get muddy pretty quick. So um, yeah, so thank you guys so much for being a part of this. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your stories. I appreciate all you do to advocate for yourself and for other people with disabilities. And I'm sure what you shared today will be really helpful. So Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank Hope you have a great, thank you. Thank you for having Melanie and organizing this. And, and Absolutely. Is that Lucas? Hi, this is my friend Lucas and his mom, Kim, who's on the board and Erica's on the board. Um, Charlie is here and he's on the board and several others that couldn't be here tonight. So we're super excited. Thanks for saying hi, Lucas. Uh -huh. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas.